Hi, this is Robert McCune. This is EDL 951, Advanced Education Leadership, and this is a module on tort liability. Um, what is tort liability? Um, there are two different kinds. There's intentional and negligence. Um, intentional tort liability uh, deals with individuals who intend to do harm to another. Um, it recognizes their actions may cause harm, and examples would be uh, battery, assault, false imprisonment, and defamation. Um, kind of in going through the court cases, it seems that negligence, uh, tort liability, um, is kind of the main factor in most of these cases. Um, it is failure to exercise the standard of care that a reasonably prudent person would have exercised in a similar situation. Um, and there are four elements to that. One, does the student, uh, or does the teacher owe a duty to the student? Um, does the teacher breach that duty? Was the teacher's failure? To fulfill her duty, um, his or her duty, the cause of the student's in injury, and then finally, did an injury occur? Um, the first court case uh, I looked at was Mitchell versus Cedar Rapids Community School District. Um, this took place in Iowa. Uh, the mother of a special education student st sued the student school district for damages sustained in an after hours off campus um, sexual assault by another student. And the jury found the school district negligent in, facing, in failing to adequately supervise the special education student and uh, damages were awarded. Um, with the questions that were asked, if this happened in your school, what reactive measures do you think would have occurred as a result? Um, I think immediately after that happens, you need to have a meeting uh, with all parties involved, uh, meeting separately with the students, the parents, um, and a legal representative should probably be involved in the discussions and uh, advice given on uh, actions to take. Um, what proactive measures uh, would you do to prevent torts from such uh, such torts from happening? Um, I think educating all stakeholders on district policies and possible consequences for these violations. Um, make everyone aware of what is happening, and then have those stakeholders sign a code of conduct to. Um, ensure that they know what's going on. Um, describe how a set of professional ethics would be beneficial with regards. Um, and this is going to be frequent in most of these cases. Um, looking at one of the union's code of ethics, um, looking at the NEA, um, the AFT, uh, looking at their code of ethics uh, would be preferred and aid tort liability um, because it would give kind of a the group uh, a code to look at. Um, the second court case is Johnson Johnson versus the school district of Millard uh, taking place in Nebraska. Um, in this case, um, Robbie Johnson, first grader at Willacatha Elementary School, was injured while attending music class um, during the playing of uh, London Bridges. Um, Johnson was swung hard and fast by two classmates um, and they accidentally released him um, and because of that fell into a bookcase, cut his head um, and uh, the cut actually went to the bone, um, divided the muscle through its length, which sounds terrible, um, suffered blurred vision for a short period of time and then continues to suffer headaches because of an injury. Um, accident occurred, the teacher had her back and was writing on the board. Um, Trial court held that the teacher's instruction to first grade students on how to play a game without direct supervision, um, at least uh, the early portions of the game, were negligent supervision. Once again, there's that term negligent. Um, if this happened in your school, what reactive measures would you have taken? Um, and it's meeting with uh, all parties involved, uh, students, parents, and once again, a legal representation uh, should be present um, just because uh, if they are thinking of um, going to court over this, um, what proactive measures would you do to prevent such torts from happening? Uh, educate faculty on proper classroom procedures and potential consequences of deviating from them. Um, in this case, um, if Ms. Patton instructs them uh, to uh, play a game that could have potential uh, a danger to it, uh, she should not have had her back turned. Um, and then how did would professional ethics be beneficial? Uh, and it's the 
uh, adopting uh, one of the various codes, uh, union's codes of ethics. A third court case is Harris, Harris X. Rel. Harris. Uh, sorry about that. Harris S. Rel. Harris versus McRae uh, in 2003. Uh, this involved a 15 year old football player who suffered heat stroke during a practice session. Um, and among those named in the suit was the football coach. Trial held against the injured athlete, citing the state of Mississippi's uh, sovereign immunity statute. Uh, Mississippi affirmed this in appellate court's view, since the football coach was exercising discretion in the exercise of his job duties as a coach, he and employers were immune from liability. Um, so they um, were not, and as it's said in the readings, most cases, um, courts find for um, the uh, school district. Um, so if this situation were to happen, what would you do? Um, it seems kind of redundant, but you have to meet with all parties involved um, and look and look at the situation, figure out what happened, um, and come to an agreement or a path forward. And if there's something of this nature where someone was injured, um, the district office needs to be notified um, and so they can figure out the best legal way uh, to move forward. What proactive measures would you do to prevent this? Um, educate faculty on proper classroom procedures, or in this case, um, proper procedures um, for coaching um, and knowing when uh, to give water breaks and knowing when um, to uh, provide uh, athletes uh, with breaks, especially if it's that hot out. Um, professional ethics, once again, adopting various unions code of ethics. Um, preferably, um, I'd probably look at the NEA's uh, code of ethics um, and how they would proceed. Um, next case is TK and SK versus the New York Department of Education. Um, this kind of is a landmark case when it comes to bullying um, and actions that should be taken as a result of bullying. Uh, in this case, the federal court applied a broad standard of liability to the New York public schools, uh, finding that a disabled student stated a valid claim that she had been denied a free and appropriate public education uh, under the IDEA Act uh, due to the school officials failure to remedy peer bullying and harassment based on her disability. Court also concluded that schools should take prompt and appropriate action when responding to bullying that may interfere with special education students' ability to obtain an appropriate education. Um, so here you have a case um, where bullying is happening, uh, particularly with a special education student and the court stepping in and saying that um, appropriate and prompt action needs to be taken. Um, so if this happened to school, what reactive measures would I take? Um, individual, uh, with the individual parents and create a behavior plan uh, for those individual students, um, especially the uh, students who were bullying, um, and work on the disabled student's family on how they get them back and engaged in the classroom. Because um, in this case, it seemed like uh, the student uh, started to become disengaged, and you never want that to happen. What proactive measures would you do to prevent such torts from happening? Um, they need to be aware. Bullying is a big issue, uh, particularly now, particularly with online bullying. Um, faculty uh, and young children, or faculty of young children through high school teachers uh, should be trained on common signs and forms of bullying, particularly cyberbullying. Um, and then uh, how would a professional set of ethics help this? Um, adapting one of the union's code of ethics um, would be beneficial uh, in this case and knowing how to proceed. And then the final case is Doe versus the Unified School District in Kansas. Um, this lawsuit was taken on behalf of a 16 year old female student who had been subjected to sexual abuse by her stepfather. Abuse had taken place since elementary school um, and in this suit um, the elementary school principal and guidance counselor were named because they were alleged to have acted negligently in their handling of the matter, that they knew about it. 
Um, early in the chain of events, students claimed that the counselor and principal received information about the abuse uh, and did not do anything about it. Um, court denied the principal's motion for summary judgment. It held that the counselor was not liable uh, for negligent failure to protect the student from sexual abuse, um, which was kind of interesting when I was reading through this case. Um, in the court's opinion, the counselor had not undertaken an affirmative duty to protect the student, and she had not created an undue risk of harm to the student. Um, going through this case, I was just kind of uh, shocked by the court's opinion in this. Um, but if this happened in their school, were it reactive measures? Um, we have a school resource counselor um, who uh, works with these types of situations. Um, definitely contacting them and meeting and have a meeting with the child's mother and to discuss potential actions if they need help or assistance uh, towards the stepfather, if there needs to be a conversation happening um, with other parties involved as well. What proactive measures uh, would you do to prevent such torts from happening? Educate staff um, on mandated reporting. Um, if there are certain situations where abuse is um, being spoken about, um, they are mandate, mandated reporters and that needs to um, be escalated and taken to uh, the proper administrators. Uh, and then describe how a set of professional ethics would help. Once again, um, it's looking at the union's code of ethics um, and offering them as a preferred aid uh, to help out in this tort liability. And here are my references on where uh, I found the court cases. Um, thank you.